Physiognomy, Wikipedia article audio. Physiognomy is the assessment of character or personality from a person's outer appearance, especially the face. The term can also refer to the general appearance of a person, object, or terrain without reference to its implied characteristics as in the physiognomy of an individual plant or of a plant community. Ancient Physiognomy Credence of such study has varied from time to time. The practice was well accepted by the ancient Greek philosophers, but fell into disrepute in the Middle Ages when practiced by vagabonds and mountebanks. It was then revived and popularized by Johann Caspar Lavater before falling from favor again in the late 19th century. Physiognomy as understood in the past meets the contemporary definition of a pseudoscience. Popular in the 19th century, it has been used as a basis for scientific racism, along with physical anthropology. Middle Ages and Renaissance no clear evidence indicates physiognomy works but the rise of artificial intelligence and machine learning for facial recognition has brought a revival of interest, and some studies that suggest that facial appearances do contain a kernel of truth about a person's personality. Modern Physiognomy Physiognomy is also sometimes referred to as anthroposcopy though the expression was more common in the 19th century when the word originated. Brown and Physiognomy Notions of the relationship between an individual's outward appearance and inner character are historically ancient, and occasionally appear in early Greek poetry. Siddhars from ancient India are also known to have defined Samudraka Lakshanam that identifies personal characteristics with body features. Chinese physiognomy or face reading reaches back at least to the Northern Song period. The first indications of a developed physiognomic theory appear in 5th century BC Athens, with the works of Zopyrus, who was said to be an expert in the art. By the 4th century BC, the philosopher Aristotle made frequent reference to theory and literature concerning the relationship of appearance to character. Aristotle was apparently receptive to such an idea, as evidenced by a passage in his prior analytics. Lavater's Critics It is possible to infer character from features, if it is granted that the body and the soul are changed together by the natural affections, I say natural, for though perhaps by learning music a man has made some change in his soul, this is not one of those affections natural to us, rather I refer to passions and desires when I speak of natural emotions. If then this were granted and also that for each change there is a corresponding sign, and we could state the affection and sign proper to each kind of animal, we shall be able to infer character from features. Period of Popularity The first systematic physiognomic treatise to survive to the present day is a slim volume, Physiognomonica, ascribed to Aristotle. The volume is divided into two parts, conjectured to have been originally two separate works. The first section discusses arguments drawn from nature or other races, and concentrates on the concept of human behavior. The second section focuses on animal behavior, dividing the animal kingdom into male and female types. From these are deduced correspondences between human form and character. After Aristotle, the major extant works in physiognomy are Modern Usage Scientific Validity In Media Related Disciplines Ancient Greek mathematician, astronomer, and scientist Pythagoras who some believe originated physiognomics once rejected a prospective follower named Silen because, to Pythagoras, his appearance indicated bad character. After inspecting Socrates, 
a physiognomist announced that he was given to intemperance, sensuality, and violent bursts of passion which was so contrary to Socrates's image that his students accused the physiognomist of lying. Socrates put the issue to rest by saying that originally he was given to all these vices, but had particularly strong self-discipline. The term was common in Middle English, often written as Fisnami or Visnomi, as in the tale of Baron, a spurious addition to the Canterbury Tales, I know weal by thy Fisnami, thy kynd it were to steal. Physiognomy's validity was once widely accepted. Michael Scott, a court scholar for Frederick II, Holy Roman Emperor, wrote Liber Physiognomy in the early 13th century concerning the subject. English universities taught it until Henry VIII of England outlawed beggars and vagabonds playing subtle, crafty and unlawful games such as physnomy or palmistry in 1530 or 1531. Around this time, Scholastic leaders settled on the more erudite Greek form physiognomy and began to discourage the whole concept of physnomy. Leonardo da Vinci dismissed physiognomy in the early 16th century as false, a chimera with no scientific foundation. Nevertheless, Leonardo believed that lines caused by facial expressions could indicate personality traits. For example, he wrote that those who have deep and noticeable lines between the eyebrows are irascible. The principal promoter of physiognomy in modern times was the Swiss pastor Johann Caspar Lavater who was briefly a friend of Goethe. Lavater's essays on physiognomy were first published in German in 1772 and gained great popularity. These influential essays were translated into French and English. Lavater found confirmation of his ideas primarily from the English physician philosopher Sir Thomas Brown, and the Italian Giambattista della Porta. Brown in his Religio Medici discusses the possibility of the discernment of inner qualities from the outer appearance of the face, thus. There is surely a physiognomy which those experienced and master mendicants observe, for there are mystically in our faces certain characters that carry in them the motto of our souls, wherein he that cannot read ABC may read our natures. RM Part 2 colon 2 Late in his life, Brown reaffirmed his physiognomical beliefs, stating in Christian morals. Polemo of Laodicea De physiognomonia, in Greek, Adamantius the Sophist, Physiognomonica, in Greek, an anonymous Latin author de physiognomonia. Since the brow speaks often true, since eyes and noses have tongues, and the countenance proclaims the heart and inclinations, let observations so far instruct thee in physiognomical lines. We often observe that men do most act those creatures, whose constitution, parts, and complexion do most predominate in their mixtures. This is a cornerstone in physiognomy, there are therefore provincial faces, national lips, and noses, which testify not only the natures of those countries, but of those which have them elsewhere. Sir Thomas Brown is also credited with introducing the word caricature into the English language, whence much of physiognomical belief attempted to entrench itself by illustrative means, in particular through the medium of political satire. Della Porta's works are well represented in the library of Sir Thomas Brown including of Celestial Physiognomy in which Porta argued that it was not the stars but a person's temperament that influences their facial appearance and character. In De Humana Physiognomia, Porta used woodcuts of animals to illustrate human characteristics. Both Della Porta and Brown adhered to the doctrine of signatures that is, the belief that the physical structures of nature such as a plant's roots, stem, and flower, 
were indicative keys to their medicinal potentials. Lavater received mixed reactions from scientists, with some accepting his research and others criticizing it. For example, the harshest critic was scientist George Christoph Lichtenberg, who said pathonomy, discovering the character by observing the behavior, was more effective. Writer Hannah Moore complained to Horace Walpole, in vain do we boast that philosophy had broken down all the strongholds of prejudice, ignorance, and superstition, and yet, at this very time Lavater's physiognomy books sell at 15 guineas a set. The popularity of physiognomy grew throughout the 18th century and into the 19th century, and it was discussed seriously by academics, who saw a lot of potential in it. Many European novelists used physiognomy in the descriptions of their characters. Notably Balzac, Chaucer, and portrait artists, such as Joseph Dukerux. A host of 19th-century English authors were influenced by the idea, notably evident in the detailed physiognomic descriptions of characters in the novels of Charles Dickens, Thomas Hardy, and Charlotte Bronte. In addition to Thomas Brown, other literary authors associated with Norwich who made physiognomical observations in their writings include the romantic novelist Amelia Opie, and the travelogue author George Borrow. Physiognomy is a central, implicit assumption underlying the plot of Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray. In 19th century American literature, Physiognomy figures prominently in the short stories of Edgar Allan Poe. Phrenology, also considered a form of physiognomy, was created around 1800 by German physician Franz Joseph Gall and Johann Spurgsim, and was widely popular in the 19th century in Europe and the United States. In the U.S., Physician James W. Redfield published his Comparative Physiognomy in 1852, illustrating with 330 engravings the resemblances between men and animals. He finds these in appearance and character, e.g. Germans to lions, Negroes to elephants and fishes, Chinamen to hogs, Yankees to bears, Jews to goats. During the late 19th century, English psychometrician Sir Francis Galton attempted to define physiognomic characteristics of health, disease, beauty, and criminality, via a method of composite photography. Galton's process involved the photographic superimposition of two or more faces by multiple exposures. After averaging together photographs of violent criminals, he found that the composite appeared more respectable than any of the faces comprising it, this was likely due to the irregularities of the skin across the constituent images being averaged out in the final blend. With the advent of computer technology during the early 1990s, Galton's composite technique has been adopted and greatly improved using computer graphics software. In the late 19th century, it became associated with phrenology and consequently discredited and rejected. Nevertheless, the German physiognomist Karl Hüter became popular in Germany with his concept of physiognomy, called psychophysiognomy. Physiognomy also became of use in the field of criminology through efforts made by Italian army doctor and scientist, Cesar Lombroso. Lombroso, during the mid-19th century, championed the notion that criminality was inherited and that criminals could be identified by physical attributes such as hawk-like noses and bloodshot eyes. Lombroso took inspiration from the recently released ideologies and studies of Darwin and carried many of the misunderstandings that he had regarding evolution into the propagation of the use of physiognomy in criminology. His logic stemmed from the idea that criminals were throwbacks in the phylogenetic tree to early phases of evolution. 
Bearing this in mind, it is reasonable to conclude that according to Lombroso, a regressive characteristic united the genius, the madman, and the delinquent, they differed in the intensity of this characteristic and, naturally in the degree of development of the positive qualities. He believed that one could determine whether one was of savage nature just by their physical characteristics. Based on his findings, Lombroso proposed that the born criminal could be distinguished by physical atavistic stigmata, such as This interest in the relationship between criminology and physiognomy began upon Lombroso's first interaction with a notorious Calabrian thief and arsonist named Giuseppe Valella. Lombroso was particularly taken by many striking personality characteristics that Valella possessed agility and cynicism being some of them. Upon Valella's death, Lombroso conducted a post-mortem and discovered that his subject had an indentation at the back of his skull, which resembled that found in apes. He later referred to this anomaly as the median occipital depression. Lombroso used the term atavism to describe these primitive, ape-like behaviors that he found in many of those whom he deemed prone to criminality. As he continued analyzing the data he gathered from said autopsy and comparing and contrasting these results with previous cases, he inferred that certain physical characteristics allowed for some individuals to have a greater propensity to offend and were also savage throwbacks to early man. As one would assume, these sorts of examinations yielded far-reaching consequences for various scientific and medical communities at the time. In fact, the natural genesis of crime implied that the criminal personality should be regarded as a particular form of psychiatric disease. Furthermore, these ideals promoted the idea that when a crime is committed, it is no longer seen as free will but instead a result of one's genetic predisposition to savagery. He had numerous case studies to corroborate many of his findings due to the fact that he was the head of an insane asylum at Pesaro. He was easily able to study people from various walks of life and was thus able to further define criminal types. Because his theories primarily focused on anatomy and anthropological information, the idea of degeneracy being a source of atavism was not explored till later on in his criminological endeavors. These new and improved theories led to the notion that the born criminal had pathological symptoms in common with the moral imbecile and the epileptic and this led him to expand his typology to include the insane criminal and the epileptic criminal. In addition, the insane criminal type include the alcoholic, the matoid, and the hysterical criminal when it comes to modern applications of Lombroso's findings and ideas, there is little to be seen. Lombroso's ideologies are now seen to be flawed and are usually relegated to the status of pseudoscience. Many have remarked on the overt sexist and racist overtones of his research and denounce it on these bases alone. In spite of many of his theories being discredited, he is still hailed as the father of scientific criminology. Modern criminology finds many of his teaching incorrect but he had a great influence over criminology and physiognomy at the time. In France, the concept developed in the 20th century under the name morphopsychology, developed by Louis Corman, a French psychiatrist who argued that the workings of vital forces within the human body resulted in different facial shapes and forms. For example, Full and round body shapes are considered the expression of the instinct of expansion while the hollow or flat shapes are an expression of self-preservation. The term morphopsychology is a translation of the French word morphopsychology, which Louis Corman coined in 1937 when he wrote his first book on the subject, Quinn's Lecons de Morphopsychology. Corman was influenced by the French doctor Claude Sigaud, 
incorporating his idea of dilation and retraction into morphopsychology. Experimental evidence has shown that people regularly judge personality characteristics from facial features, and that these judgments are shared by others, it appears, moreover, that the same judgments occur cross-culturally. Research in the 1990s indicated that three elements of personality in particular, power, warmth, and honesty, can be reliably inferred. Some evidence indicates people can detect male homosexuality by looking at facial characteristics or at the pattern of whorls in the scalp, though subsequent research has largely refuted the findings on hair whorl patterns. A February 2009 article in New Scientist magazine reported that physiognomy is living a small revival, with research papers trying to find links between personality traits and facial traits. A study of 90 ice hockey players found that a wider face in which the cheekbone to cheekbone distance was unusually large relative to the distance between brow and upper lip was linked in a statistically significant way with the number of penalty minutes a player was given for violent acts including slashing, elbowing, checking from behind and fighting. This revival has been confirmed in the 2010s with the spectacular rays of machine learning for facial recognition. For instance researchers have claimed that it is possible to predict upper body strength and some personality traits only by looking at the width of the face. In 2017, a controversial study claimed that an algorithm could detect sexual orientation more accurately than humans. According to BBC News, the work has been accused of being dangerous and junk science. In early 2018, researchers, among which two specialists of AI working at Google, issued a reportedly contradicting study based on a survey of 8,000 Americans using Amazon's Mechanical Turk crowdsourcing platform. The survey yielded many traits helping to discriminate between gay and straight respondents with a series of yes-slash-no questions. These traits had actually less to do with morphology than with grooming, presentation, and lifestyle. For more information of this sexual orientation issue in general, see Gaydar. Other clues have also been proposed to refute physiognomist claims. For example, the human mind tends to extrapolate emotions from facial expressions and physiognomy, with its assumption of permanent characteristics, would only be an overgeneralization of this skill. Also, if one classifies a person as untrustworthy due to facial features, and treats them as such, that person eventually behaves in an untrustworthy way toward the person holding this belief. In 2011, the South Korean news agency Yonhap published a physiognomical analysis of the current leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un. Large jaws, forward projection of jaw, low sloping forehead, high cheekbones, flattened or upturned nose, handle-shaped ears, hawk-like noses or fleshy lips, hard shifty eyes scanty beard or baldness, insensitivity to pain, long arms relative to lower limbs.